Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership bassist, Nathan Watts, best known as a longtime Stevie Wonder collaborator and his eventual musical director. His playing is featured on seminal Wonder albums like Songs in the Key of Life, Hotter Than July, and A Time to Love. He is heard on classic songs like I Wish, Did I Hear You Say You Love Me, I Ain't Gonna Stand For It, Frontline, Do I Do, These Three Words, My Love Is On Fire, and most recently, Can't Put It In The Hands Of Fate. Among many other notable credits, he has worked extensively with the Jacksons, Lenny Williams, Tina Marie, the Pointer Sisters, Lionel Richie, Billy Preston, Dionne Warwick, Diana Ross, Attempts, Paul McCartney, Ray Parker, and Denise Williams. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm a, <laughs> one more, one more. Bes right. Besides, besides mastering the bass, he once considered becoming an accountant, and much later earned a doctorate in theology. Yeah, that, that about cover it, Nate. How you doing, man? All right, brother. How you doing? It's good to see you. Likewise, thank you so much for joining the show. Uh -huh. What's going on? Hey, you got it. You know, we were talking uh, uh, before we started recording here, and uh, you're in Detroit, and you just want to quickly uh, tell the folks why you're there? I'm here for the Detroit Base Day on uh, the 19th, and uh, we're doing a show in front of the Motown Museum uh, for all the iconic bass players that came from Detroit, the ones that could make it, and the ones still living, and uh, tribute yeah. to Jameson. That's fantastic. That's a cradle of it right there, man, in Detroit. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's where we all came from, grew up from. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Now, I understand, did you start on trumpet and then you moved to bass? Uh, how did that work? Well, uh, elementary, I started playing the trumpet. And uh, and me and two other guys, and the, actually three other guys, a guy named Linwood, a guy named Ollie Brown and a guy named Ray Parker. Ray Parker played clarinet, Ollie played drums, and uh, Linwood played trumpet. And we went to school when the high school. We said we should start a band. We had a band, and, and we got written up in Detroit Free Press uh, when we were eight years old and stuff. So anyway, I kept going. I went to the marching band, went to Region 2, and then after I got to high school, I realized that I wasn't going to be Lee Morgan. <laughs> You know, I'm going to be a great trumpet player. So a friend of mine said, "Hey, mate, hey man, why don't you try to play bass?" Then we, uh, uh, we, uh, he was playing guitar, and he said we could be like Hendrix. And I took up bass, and then next thing you know, he left. The guy name was Ray Parker. He told, he told me I should play bass. That's how I started playing bass. Wow. Now um, I've had Ollie on the show, uh, hoping to get Ray. Ray's not been on, but. Um, <laughs> What was it like working with those guys when they were teenagers? Because Ray was so talented just early on, right? Right. Well, you know, Ray, Ray, once he hit the guitar, it was over. Okay. 
they start playing with a big band. And uh, during that time, I was playing in a marching band, playing trumpet. And I was playing with a local group called, when I first started playing bass after Ray left and told me to play bass, and he left. I played with a, a local group called The Final Decisions. And uh, we had one good hit. We, we, we got the number one locally. And then I got the call for Stevie. Now, how'd you get uh, good on bass so quickly, you know? In the basement, baby. Like where I'm at now, in the basement, okay? I worked at Ford's for a week. I, my friend just reminded me that I only worked there a week in the foundry. And uh, all during the time when I was learning, I taught, I'm self-taught. So I, I would go down to the basement, listen to the records, and learn it by ear. But I can read, too, though. That's the whole thing. I just had to try uh, 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 transfer a class from trouble to bass. Now, obviously, James uh, Jamerson, big influence. Uh, who else was an influence for you? Uh, Chuck Rainey, a guy named Lucky Scott. And let me think who else, who else, who, who else? Lucky, uh, Chuck, and, and, uh, and, and who else? Oh, Bob Babbitt. Bob Babbitt. Had, uh, and, and the guy is on the show with us, Tony Newton. And he, he, he was in front of playing trouble. I used to watch him play. And he was a great bass, bass player. Mostly yeah. bass. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sorry, Tony. Yeah. Um, so now Ollie had already been playing with Stevie, right? So was that uh, like a foot in the door? Oh, uh, no, no. Ollie was playing because Ray was playing with Stevie first. Ray played with Stevie, brought Ollie in. Ali and then uh, uh, Ali left, and then I uh, I came after that. After Reggie McBride, another bass player was great from Detroit. He he went on to, uh, and he joined the Rare Earth, and um, I, I I got the call and I got the gig. I was lucky, man. I was praying hard, praying hard, brother. I'm praying hard because I wasn't going back to Detroit. I said I'm not going back, bro. I'll tell you. There it is. God bless me. How old were you, Nate? 20. 20. Wow. Um, tell us if you can remember your first time meeting Stevie. Okay. I could tell you that easy. Okay. Uh, we um, was doing the Push concert for Jesse Jackson in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, they, they called me. Uh, to, uh, one of the guys who worked with him called me and told me to learn as much as I could. And come. They flew me down. My first flight, too. Flew me down to Memphis, Tennessee. I went back to step behind stage, and um, he was sitting there. That's the first time I met him. And I said, "Hi, I'm Nate. I had a, I had a funky bass. I had a national, a national. <laughs> it's a short scale national. I can't believe it because you know, I, hey, I, I, I just had started. Been playing two years, and um, I uh, I went down and I, I and we went over a couple of songs and stuff, and it was great. Uh, at least I, I thought it was great." But, uh, and then um, and I played I Was Made the Lover, just playing around. He said, oh, you know that song? I said, yes, which is Jameson's, one of Jameson's greatest bass lines to me. It was ridiculous. But anyway, I learned that because of my cousin who gave me the 45 uh, 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 of it. And I sat home and went to the basement and learned it. That's it. And, uh, and we, we, we did the show at the Push concert, our, our, our concert, uh, and, um, the whole thing about it was this. We did the first two songs, went halfway decent. Then he played Contusions. I had never heard Contusions. <laughs> if you imagine that, so I just went to watch it. I got nervous. I got crafts in my hands and everything. And uh, I just went over and followed his, uh, uh, his left hand. Every time he hit his left hand, I hit a goose egg, goose egg. But when I made it through. He, he flew me back to California audition, and I, I actually got the gig. I was surprised. Ray, Ray Parker recommended me. And so you first uh, started doing a, J a Japan tour, is that right? No, I think the first thing we did, we did, uh, God, that's, that's, that you talked 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, I think I think the first big tour was Japan. We rehearsed, and then we went to Japan in 75. That's right. You're right about that. I think so. If I remember right. So what, what was Stevie like to work with, uh, you know, early on? Oh, it was amazing, man. It was amazing. I learned so much from him, man, just just, just musically about theory and all everything else. I mean, God's a genius. Everybody knows that. But then they call him, you know, you know, you don't you don't take a lightning, but until you get into his school, 
of uh, 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 the school of wonder. That's what we call it. Because Ray came through it. He learned how to write. Ali came through it. So many people came. Denise came through it. So many people that came through it and learned so much from it. So it was, it was a great learning experience being 20 years old about music. And then you're playing with one of the greats. So, you know what I mean? It's just amazing. How how big was the band at that time? Ooh, we had maybe 11 pieces, maybe more, 14. We had two guitars, keyboard player, Steve, bass, percussion, drums, and four singers. Did you count that up for me? <laughs> <laughs> Double figures for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so did it take a while for you to kind of pick up on like uh movements stevie might do like head nods or whatever to cue the, oh, the band oh yeah oh, oh yeah it took me you know but i i, I fell in we rehearsed before we left and i started i would watch him and he said nate watch this with nate nate this was nate 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 he would tell me and i watch it i learned real quick you know being self-taught self-taught helped me a lot and i you know overall learning his gestures and learning musically where it was going. So when you first got in there, was was Ray still playing with him or Ray had left? Oh, Ray was gone. Ray was yeah. gone. Yeah. Ray, 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 well, I tell you, Ray recommended he was working doing the 20,000 sessions a day. Okay. Back in the 70, this is in 74. Okay. He left, I think he left Steve in 72 or 73. And uh, we went on his own. Next thing you know, we had uh, we had uh, Jack and Jill. He had a song. He had his deal, and he was, he was on the way. So, by the way, I'm, by, by the way, I'm doing an album that'll be released in September. It's called uh, 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 Music Multiplex. I'll send you a copy of of that too. Oh, beautiful uh, man! That's always great news. Yeah, yeah, can't wait for that. Um, thanks. Mm hmm. So uh, you mentioned Contusion was challenging. Was there any other uh, songs in the Stevie repertoire that were kind of challenging for you? Uh, Contusion was the one song on Contusion was over. I mean, because Contusion, I mean, if you never heard Contusion and, and, and then when you learn it, it's, it, 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 it's a hell, uh, he's got so many songs that are complex, really does. And, uh, and, 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 you know, you have to take your time and learn them and, but Katusha was the first, very first hard song I ever played. But I played a little jazz. I played with a big band when, when I first started. And uh, I had an ear. I had a, a decent ear. But the first time, I forgot to tell you this part about the audition. But I auditioned with the other bass players. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I mean, after I did the Push concert and they flew me to L.A., <laughs> Steve told Ray, he said, he can be good. He can be, he can be good. But his bass sounds funny. <laughs> that was my national bass. If you remember, that was from Montgomery Wards, the national brand back in the day. <laughs> okay, because, uh, we call it Monkey Wards. <laughs> but uh, I had to borrow Ray's Fender Precision to do the audition. Okay, I had to put that in. I don't never forget that. He reminded me that of that the other day. <laughs> Time to step up, right? All right. And as soon as I got the gig, I, when I got a precision. How did he kind of decide whether he wanted to, you know, feature the the keys as sort of the baseline or, or get you in there more prominent? Well, he was always, you know, he was in charge. Okay. So, like, I actually, I only got like one fourth of all the songs we ever did. He ever did oh, since I've been there. Right. Or uh, one third, one fourth, about one fourth. Like uh, on Songs of Care Life, only, I played on seven songs and the rest of them he played keyboard. Key bass. And that's out of 21 songs. So I was lucky. I was lucky. He, he knew what he wanted me to play and what he was going to do. A lot of stuff, though, I did uh, the demo with him, and then he came back and did it, you know, his own way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you would help give him some ideas for the bass line, and then he would run I, with it? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I was learning from him. I was a young kid. Like, uh, I'll tell you what. We did Isn't She Lovely, uh, and, uh, and he decided that he wanted to do it himself because uh, it was about his daughter, right? It was about his daughter. I said he played everything on there, on the song. And he was used to playing everything on the song. So I, if anything, I learned a lot more from him than he ever learned from me. 
you know, you, you know, I'm going to tell you just like this. But I think we, I heard some things that I remember, though. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. What, what was it like being in the studio with him for the first time? For the first time. Ooh, I had never, I had been in the studio. Like I said, we had, uh, uh, we had a single called, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, just keep on walking by the final decisions in 73. Uh, and but uh, then the studio with him, I had never been in a studio that plush and that big and that we did with John Fish back in the day or the two engineers. It was like, and, and in Cal California too. Oh my god, it was amazing. I was in awe of, of California and the, and, and the studio. How did he direct? How did he direct uh, people in the studio? Oh, in the studio though, though. is he just? Um, it, I mean, he. I think of Stevie Winder as kind of a perfectionist in the studio. But a lot, a lot of times we would rehearse the songs before we came to the studio. So actually, we know what we're going to play, and then they say, "Oh, uh, are you playing too much, or or are you not playing enough? I want you to do this here, that, that." But most of the time, we rehearse the song and we were ready. Uh, Sir Duke was like that with the band. We did that with the band. I wish he called me at three o'clock at night. Uh, I just had left the studio. He called and said, "I got a song I want you to play on," and um, uh, I came back at three o'clock. So that's where the aggression came on. You know, they, they, uh, 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 it was just like I'm sleepy. <laughs> I'm a young sleepy kid, but it came out great. How how'd you feel when you first heard I Wish on the radio? Oh man, can you believe it? Can you believe it? Well, check this out. This was amazing. This is the most amazing thing. I was one of the co-writers on three with Denise Williams, right? All right. We were number one in England with that song. Maurice, what right? Thank you, Maurice. God bless you, man. He um he he produced the song on Denise. We was number one in England. And uh, was number two in America, going to number one, and I wish came out at number one and never moved for 16 weeks. Okay, <laughs> 16 weeks. But uh, I, I, so I'm on the number one and number two record at 20, uh, 21 years old, 22 years old. Okay, I was like, oh my god, how can that be? You know, There's, it was man, it was great, man. It was great. It was great. Wow. Did did you uh, spend any time with Maurice White? I, I, I met him a couple of times. I knew the well, men, but then we're friends. You know, we've been friends a long time. But Maurice, he called me in for do some other stuff for, you know, play one more uh, on Denise uh, on the second album. But the first album, actually, I didn't play on it. It was, uh, he took my demo, it was Berdine playing on it. On the first on, on Free. I Want to Be Free. That was Berdine. But I wrote it, so that's all that matters. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Me. Well, that's two of my favorite songs of all time. I wish and free. Really? You bet, uh, man. Those are fantastic. I mean, they're just uh, timeless. Yep. Yeah. Oh man, I, I no, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> I just saw it on Instagram <laughs> where they did free, and they they, they cover free. But they put the the different lyrics in it, okay? <laughs> I, I probably can see it. Uh, it's a, I just I just got me some weed, <laughs> some weed, some weed. <laughs> I said, "Oh my God!" They took my song in a weed song. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I don't smoke. Oh, okay, so, okay, I couldn't believe it. Let's show you my social media, huh? Yeah. Well, and look at that. I mean, it's 50 years later or whatever yeah, almost. And, you exactly, know, exactly, exactly what I'm saying. Part of, part of the culture. Yes, yes, it is. It is. So, so, now, Steve, Steve, Stevie was uh, kind of notorious for being a bit of a prankster. You know, uh, how, how did that come out early when you were with him? Oh, oh I'm going to tell you this, this tragic story, okay? So we're in New York. It's 1975. We're going to Human Kindness Day, okay? And so uh, that's when we, it was at the Washington Monument in 1975. Larry Graham was there. There was a whole bunch of people there. It was a human kindness day. So before we got there, we was in New York. We stayed in 1975. We was deciding whether to go to L.A. or to take the office to the L.A. or to um, 
uh, uh, stay in New York. So I stay in New York. Anyway, it was another, uh, he was getting out the cab and I grabbed the door. I said, Steve, you should get out there. I said, oh, no, no, I know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And, 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 and I, had, I was holding the door, right? And he heard the car guard and slammed the door on my finger. This finger. I had to go get stitches right before the year. Okay. And, I, and I learned, that's how I learned how to play with three fingers now. I, I still play with three fingers now. And when I, one thing that made me happy, Larry Graham told me, uh, he said, hey, kid, you're doing good. You're going to be good. You're going to be good. And when I never forgot that. From Larry Graham, come on. Come on. And I just had to start playing. That was the compliment of life. I'm telling you. Because I was a sly fanatic. We all were then. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Man. So, um, well, did, uh, but, but, uh, he tended to, uh, um, make a lot of jokes and he wasn't like, how serious was he? You know, cause we seem kidding around all the time when he's out in public, but he's always kidding, man. He's always kidding. He takes it to jokes. He, he mean, you know, he, he, he's trying to find his humor, you know, he, they take to tell him to say, you know, they take his glasses off and look at you. What are you saying? <laughs> you know, I mean, like you can see, and he's been doing that for years. Good cat at heart, man. Songs in the Key of Life was notoriously like delayed. You know, it was in the media all the time back then when Stevie came in with that record, and it had so much publicity before it finally came out. Um, do you remember like that happening, and that it was kind of delayed, and maybe you thought it was going to come out, then it was another. Stevie takes his time on anything he does. He's like you said, he's a perfectionist. We started, I started playing, I did ass in 1975 in New York, 74, and we started really working hard in 74 and it was released in 76. So that's very short for him for 21 songs. You know what I mean? And uh it was a lot of publicity. It was supposed to, it was waiting for it after uh fulfilling his first um, uh, fulfilling his first finale. That's what Reggie played on. And I came right on that right after that. And that came out in 74. So uh it's amazing. It's amazing that he it only took two years for him to do the, the, the 21 uh a double album. So I I don't know what what was delayed, but he takes his time. He wants his a certain way, and he's gonna do it until he gets it a certain way. That that's so funny about it. Looking back at it now, it doesn't seem like a long time at all. But back then, everyone was coming like every year with a record, you know. Right, right, um, right. So right. Exactly. He was kind of like he was the first one to take like two to two and a half years, and then later, you know, people started doing that every time, taking longer. Yeah. If you want your stuff right, you wait. You know, he's the kind of guy. He got to have his stuff right. All right, and he did twenty one songs. It, most albums only had 10 at the most, or eight, 10 the songs, right? Am I right? Correct. So he did 21 songs in two years. So that was an amazing feat right there. I agree, yeah. But um, the narrative, though, in the media was different at the time. That's what I remember. Yeah. Did you make the rounds with all the awards shows and things like that, too? A lot of them I made. I mean, the... the, the uh, from um, all, all the way up to the 90s and maybe some of the two early 2000s. But, you know, a lot of times, well, you know, I would be there, uh, we'll play there at American Music Awards. Uh, now, uh, yeah, this is um, a lot of different shows. We did. We did tributes to Ella. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did tri tributes to Ella and different things, you know? So, yeah, I've been around. I was lucky enough. To, I was blessed that he took me. He didn't have to. He did. So you went on, you know, to work with so many other folks. How did that Stevie Wonder and Songs in the Key of Life sort of serve as a platform to help propel you to all that other stuff? It, it, it introduced me. I was playing with Stevie. Come on. Oh, <laughs> this guy was playing with Stevie? Let's get the guy to play with Stevie. Did you hear how I wish? Did you hear uh, Ask? He's got his fucking That's when the Jacksons called me. They were from the few first people. Actually, I did the Mighty Clouds of George before that. Uh, uh, my that was a religious group, and uh, who else did I do before that? That was one of my first recordings, Mo, uh, besides Stevie. Then I went to the Jacksons, and um, it was great working with him. Michael was so talented, man. People don't have to realize how talented Michael really was. 
when we did a uh, heartbreak hotel okay we did the track i did the track and he said well put some fills on it and i put my fills yeah i like that i like that I like that and then paul jackson came was a guitar player came in he had a tape for paul jackson of the solo he had sung the way he wanted and paul played it exactly what he had on the tape i had never seen nobody do that you know what i mean I had never seen nobody do that. So, I mean, the Jackson was a great experience for me. A very great. Me and Ali played on that album together. On the first. Mm -hmm. That's the end trial. Yeah. So it yeah. was great. It was amazing, man. I, I talent. And, you know, one thing about it, uh, people didn't realize that he was a connoisseur of, 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 uh, of dancing. He had archives. I used to go over to my, a house on Haven, Havenhurst. And he had archives of all the dads of Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, the Nicholas Brothers, everybody you could think of, any kind of dance routine you could think of, stuff I had never heard of. And he was studying. He was studying everything that was there. That's what made him such a great entertainer. He was dedicated. How good was Jermaine on bass? Jermaine was good. But uh, Jermaine is good on bass, man. But did you know I played on Let's Get Serious? Oh, uh, well, Stevie, back with Stevie and with Jermaine yeah, yeah, and that one. Yeah, exactly. I played bass on that. That's a great bass line. Oh, man, I had fun with that one. Oh, that's one of my rawest ones, too. That in Highbrook Hotel. Okay, and I wish. I got I got, I got some, uh, uh, quite a few. Quite a few. I'm still looking away there. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, just looking at your list of credits, so some of the early ones, I mean, there's so many I could mention, and I can't mention them all, but... I saw you worked with Harvey Mason, that Funkin' and Mason yeah. Jar. I love that record. Yep. And that's uh, one. First time working with Harvey, man. I was uh, uh, Bobby Lyle. I, mean, I worked with a lot of cats, the older cats back in the day. They, they, they uh, you know, they, I, they, I guess they like, wanted me to play. I had the feel they wanted. So that was good. And it might be because I was playing with Stevie, too. It could be that. It could have. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> He uh -huh. did a lot of records with uh, Lenny Williams too. Yes, I did. That's right. I was, I was, I've been blessed, man. I thank God every day, all of the, the, the places I've been and the things I've seen. I've been around the world five times, and I'll be seventy next year. Well, God Seven. bless, God bless, man. So, so great that you're still playing and still, you know, up and at it. Because, uh, man, we've we we're losing too many great ones from back in the golden era. What what else can I do? <laughs> <laughs> you got to do what you love, man. You love. I've been loving this for like fifty years. I mean, no, fifty two years. Next year, fifty two. I started seventy two, and this is what twenty four. Yeah, next year twenty four. Yeah. Hey Nate, do you remember um, Secret Life of Plants? Did um, did did Stevie Wonder? Did Stevie seem disappointed with how that was received? No, he did his best. I thought he did a great job myself personally, and uh, and, and see the whole thing about it <clears throat> is this: he did a track. I mean, a, a score for Single Life of Plants by Verbal. Come on, he he never seen it. Okay, he created the songs around what he thought that Plants would do. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great album, man. Uh, and the, I guess they, uh, the public wasn't ready for it. You know, they wanted to hear I Wish Again. You know what I mean? That, I guess that's what it was. Hotter Than July was a great record, too. I think that, that um, it's well-received and talked about, but I think it's even better than what they talk about. Well, I, I know I, we had fun with that. Dennis Davis, God bless his soul. He played some stuff on that. He was the uh, drummer during that time. And uh, he played with Bowie too, and um, uh, he he played it. But it was a great band. It was a great band effort, that's for sure. And I love uh, Frontline. That's the song that kind of got lost on uh, Musicarium, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Frontline. I'm standing on the front line. Oh, that's him and Charlie Wilson sang on that song too. I think. Frontline. I think so. I can't remember, but. I, I, I love that. That was a great song, too. 
And I always figured that you and Nathan East maybe got uh, mixed up sometimes by folks. And he said that that was the case that uh, happened at least once that he remembered. One thing he said to me that made me feel so great. We were doing uh, hospital toys. That's what we do every year to give toys for kids. He came to the show. He had his daughters with him, right? He came up to me. He said, girls, come here. I want you to meet somebody. This is Nathan Watts. This is Nathan Watts. Ice Man is one of the greatest bass players. I learned so much from him, listening to him play. I want, let, I want y'all to meet him. And you know that your dad loves this man. I was like, blown out the box that he told his daughters that. You know what I mean? I was blown out the box. And we've been friends every day. Yeah, we was always friends, so it didn't make no difference. We just said, uh, I would just go, East, East Watts, East Watts, East Watts. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the East West, East Watts. Nathan East. Yeah, I like that neighborhood, East Watts. Uh, yeah, East Watts, yeah. That's it. I had to put that in there. You can use it if you can. You, you, yeah. can, you can confirm yeah. with him. Well, both of you uh, were on A Time to Love. so Yes, yes we, were. we were. He played upright. He played upright. I wasn't an upright player, okay? I learned upright after I got with Steve. Okay, I played my first upright song was with Steve on Song Ski of Life. Mama song. I play upright on that. I hope you record it here. That's some, that, but he's been playing upright all the time. I, you know, I'm still not as deficient as he, he is, or mostly, uh, oh, this young cat, Brandon Rose. You got to get him on here. His name is Brandon Rose. Don't forget him. What, what's one of the most. Um unforgettable performance memories you have with Stevie? I think it was 84. Uh oh 84 um, in Japan. 84 in Japan. He wasn't feeling good. He wasn't feeling good. And he played his buzz and sung his buzz. I've seen him at times where that I know he was sick. He had a cold or whatever. And he still made it through. That should let me know how, how tough the guy really is. You know what I mean? So the Japan and Japan during that time he was sick and he sung the whole we did a whole show. I'm doing back then we did three hour shows. Okay. And so it was, that was one of the most I can't it was, I, it was in Japan. I know it was in Japan. I think it's 84. Hmm. Do you ever remember uh, having experience with maybe uh your bass didn't show up at a gig or some kind of issue like that? I make sure I no no I try to carry my base with me you know and I stop letting my precisions go out because they they, they um they smash one of them my uh, my and I took them off the road and I stopped playing this I'm playing a boss now this is a boss and uh, they don't even make these anymore the the, the guy who made it told you made me four of them and um uh, and, and, and you know it's great bases. They got some good bases out there, period, anyway. But this is one I'm not, I'm not taking on the road. What's the most important aspect of a bass to you? Is it the uh, the tone, the feel? The, uh... the tone and the feel. The tone and the feel. If it don't feel right on the neck or on, on, on a bridge, that don't feel right. That don't feel right. And ain't right. So have you ever seen Stevie kind of get frustrated or, or mad in the studio? At, um, most of the time, it's self. Okay? Most of the time, I see the man, I'm not, I, the only time I see him angry, he was just uh, discouraged or get, uh, the, 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 he was just mad at what he did. He, he, he would get mad at, at the way something turned out. That's the only thing. But because he, he was a professional. He's a professional. He wanted a certain way and he wanted to come. He never got mad at the band. He'll say, hey, man, Nate, don't play so much, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the only, only thing I ever got from it. Make it simpler. Make it simpler. Don't play so much. You're playing too much. That's the only time he ever said anything to me. And that was later on in years when I really learned how to play. <laughs> uh, well, especially uh, as time time went on, you know, he released stuff less frequently. So how would it be usually when he would want you for a session would he have somebody call you? Would he call you? Would you just wait? Oh, to yeah, hear somebody, from him? somebody say, hey, Nate, uh, since I've been in the music, I say, Nate, I'm going to the studio. And uh, I want you there. And I want who else and who else, who else, who else. Who else. So I want to. That, that's the way it works. A lot of times we still do the song. We did songs 
through the eighties and nineties at, at the shows and rehearsals and stuff. And then when he said, "Well, I'm gonna cut that song tonight. I need y'all to be there." Okay, that's how I went. Do you feel that or know if you're on a lot of recordings that are in the can, not released? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh heck yeah! Uh, at least at least got fifty to a hundred of stuff over the years that he never released. We just did a song. On his, oh, matter of fact, he's gonna release the album. I forgot to tell you that. He's releasing the album uh, probably next month, or, uh, September or, or, or this month. He said he's gonna release it. It's coming up soon. It's gonna be great. He got everybody on it. It's great. It's gonna be a great album. That's well, sure. that would be great because he's only released one since uh, the millennium started. Well, he just changed company. He's got his, <laughs> uh, he's got his own record label now, so he got to do what he got to do. So it's going to be good. It's going to be good. We play, I, I, I played on a song with me, and uh, Anderson Pop, and Ray Parker played on a song with him. And it, we, it, it, it's a great song. It's going to be all right. Wow. Did I saw, I think it was last week, uh, Intervisions. You're talking about 50 years. Intervisions turned 50 years old uh, yeah. like last week. No, it had to be more than 50 now. 73 it came out. It's 73. So, what's that yeah. came out in 74 then? And uh, uh, Fulfilling His Personality must have came out in 74 when I joined. Yeah. 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 That's what five years wrong. You're right. You're right. You're right. And then, uh, uh, Sons of Kill Out came out in '76. What, what's wow. a couple? What, what's a couple of the songs that you didn't do in studio that are like the ones that you really enjoy playing? You know, like is it like a higher ground or what do you really like playing? Higher ground. Higher ground. Actually, we're doing that at base day. It's the last, the closing song. Uh, I'm doing a song with a, a, a bass song that I have. I see a copy of it. We'll, uh, we'll get through, but uh, uh, and, uh, we're gonna end the show. With high ground, high ground is a great feel song, and it makes everybody happy. I'm sure you're familiar with the Red Hot Chili Peppers version. Did you oh, like that? Flea, Flea, what's up, Flea? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's a, that's a bad boy. Okay, <sighs> that's it. How would you characterize your playing style, Nate? It's a cross between Rainy, me. And James, I took what I thought the way they played and played it my way. You know what I mean? I, I, and then with the help of Steve, I developed a, a, my own style. All right, because like I said, I only been playing two years. I see the original copy of uh, this first song I played recording on, and you see, you can tell from there that a lot of stuff that I play now was back there when I first started playing. What would you say was different when you would do sessions with Stevie for things like Jungle Fever, Conversation Peace, and like later on versus when you were early on? Well, I knew more. I knew more musically where he was going. I know what the what the, the, the progressions that he did. I learned his progressions in the first maybe he had I I figured out that he had eight progression patterns that he used a lot. And he'd mix them up, you know what I mean? So I learned once I learned the progression patterns, uh, uh, I learned, you know, I, I learned a lot about his music. And it made me a better player, you know? Some people never learn, never, never get it, but you know, and now he's going somewhere, I know where he's going, you know what I mean, by being there so long. Stevie Wonder is one of those guys, I think, you know, there's no one who's more talented and gifted than Stevie Wonder in the music. Um, and, but out of all those gifts he has, what do you think is his greatest talent? Um, creativity. He could take a, uh, what he, from his mind or what he hears people talking about. Come on. You listen, 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 listen to a ribbon in the sky. How, how do a man think about a ribbon in the sky? Okay. And not see the sky. You know what I mean? His creativity is incredible. I mean, I wish. There's another one. Look on back on when I was nappy-headed boy. How did you know you was nappy-headed? <laughs> it's just creativity, man. 
that's the main thing, creativity. Okay? And he knows how to put the music and how to put it in the words. And that's a God given gift. Have you had much opportunity, if any, to uh, play bass with him playing drums? I wish. It was the first one. So he's playing drums. But was did you do that uh, together in studio or separate? Yeah, separate. I wish I did separate. I told you you called me back at 3 o'clock in the morning okay. after you put it together. Yeah, separate. He played a lot of songs with him. Oh, a lot. He didn't play on ass. He played a lot of songs by himself. And I played with him. So, I'm just I'm just trying to visualize Nate if you've had a chance where he's actually behind the kit and you're playing bass and you guys just you know fooled around together or whatever. Oh yeah, we've been there. We did that many a time, many times. Most of the times when we're doing it, uh, he'll, he'll put the drums on and put it like he wanted, and then he'll call me and do, do, do overdub. And a lot of stuff that happened like that. But a lot of times he would sit down like in rehearsals and. Uh, Sound checks, and we sit down and jam like that where you get behind the drums. But usually, when he were on the records, he will already have the drums done. If he played drums, he would have all, already did it. That's why he called me back on I Wish. He was here and finished the drums. I was just curious about that because people seldom see him actually play drums, and I think he's underrated, you know, doing that too. Yeah. Yeah, he's playing. We got a, we got a young kid now named Stanley Randolph. He's playing his butt off. Dennis Davis is a great job. Raymond Pounds was there when we did Songs Kill Life. So he's, he knows what a good drummer he is. And he came from the school of Motown with Benny Benjamin. And, you know, Euro Jones, where all his cats played right here, and he studied. He looked, that's what I said about his creativity. He was one of the cats. Uh, I mean, that was the, the, the Funk Brothers was ridiculous, okay? They were ridiculous. And he, he picked up all the stuff from them. That's it. It's amazing. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, Nate, looking at your 80s uh, work, uh, what was it like working with Tina Marie? Tina was my girl. I used to go to the house. She, that was my girl. My, boy, my friend played well. I wrote Ooh La La La, Alan McGuire. That was a bass player. He came in. Uh, uh, he wrote Ooh La La La. And we got uh, and he and uh, 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 Square Bears. Okay, I came out. I, 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 so he played on most of the stuff with Tina, but I played on a couple with Tina. Tina was my guy. I used to go to Tina's house and fry chicken for her. She would love. Nate, can you come over and fry some chicken for her? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, she was great talent. I remember when I first met her, Rick. Uh, I met him. I, I knew Rick James too. And uh, Rick is one who discovered it. And uh, I, well, I discovered he made a, a hit. Well, anyway, he said, Nate, I got this girl. This girl singing her ass off. It was my language. See the butt off. Oh, man. And that's how I met her. That's how I first met her through him. And then we became friends. And, I, and I used to, like I said, I used to go over the house to cook and hang out and record with her in the studio and uh, uh, mess around and sing. It was, it was a good time. God bless her soul. I miss her. Yeah, she's one of my favorites for sure. Of female singers. Yeah, she a character in a class. Okay, that's for sure. And um, what about Lionel Richie? Lionel, 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 you know the first tour I did with Steve. Okay, so it wasn't Japan. The first tour we did was in the states with Lionel Richie. Uh, uh, Lionel Richie of uh, the, uh, the Commodores. Uh, Rufus, Chaka Khan and Rufus, and um, and uh, Gino Benelli. We did a tour around the States. That was in 74. And we got Japan in 75. That's how that went. So the first tour was with Chaka, Commodore. That's where I first met, met Lionel. Back then, when I was a young kid. And Chaka, too. Okay? 20 years old. And then he, they called me on one album, one song on it. They called me to play on this album later in the 80s. And it was great. It was a good thing. We were, we were all we were still friends. That's a good thing. But, that's, uh, you know. That's quite a lineup at that show that you mentioned. Oh, man, come <laughs> on. Come on. Chaka Khan, Lana, uh, the Commodores, and Gino Manelli. But Gino, Gino joined us in Canada. Okay? Because, you know, he's Canadian. It was great. Hell of a experience. My ears went open. And, uh, and what I told uh, uh, 
Ron, Ron, the bass player with the Commodores there at the time. Uh, uh, I said, he said, man, you sound like, how long have you been playing? I said, two years. He said, you're a damn lie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my boy. He's over in New Zealand. He's, he's still alive. That's a good yeah. thing. Ron LaPred. Yeah, he's been on the show. He's actually uh, living in oh, uh, New Zealand. Oh, yeah, he's still over in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the Pointer Sisters, you were on some of their big records, oh, right? Oh, man. Great, great guy. Me and JR. Uh, we, we, we were in great. And, 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 I'm too great to play. Who was that? That was John Barnes. Oh, uh, so excited. Slow hand. Oh, to some, to some great songs. They were great people, man. I miss June. I miss everybody, man. It just, oh, we had such a great time during that time. Man, but that, like, early 80s period, you were on so many of the top hits of that era. Yeah, I've been blessed. Like I said, I thank God every day. Every day. That's for and, sure. And Paul McCartney? Paul McCartney, Gasly, Michael did that. I did the demo with Michael, okay? Oh, I'm a little way again. I did the, demo with, <laughs> did the demo with Michael, right? Uh, and, and he took it to Paul because Paul was supposed to overdub it. And when I met Paul at the 60th, uh, uh, the 60th anniversary we did uh, for the Queen, I met him then. That's the first time I met him. I said, well, Paul, uh, I, I, I want to thank you for letting me stay on the island. He said, yeah, you did that with Michael. That's great. And I said, uh, well, it was my pleasure meeting you, man. And I've learned so much from Jameson. And you, he said, let me stop you right there. We've learned so much from Jameson. I was like blown out the box that he said that. I said, wow. He said, we've learned so much from Jameson. I said, wow. And, uh, and then, then he said, and I heard you cutting up on stage. <laughs> I, said, I couldn't believe it. Great experience, man. But like I said, nobody realized how bad, incredible Michael was, too. You know? He did that song in, 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 in L.A. and shipped it over to Paul uh, and, and, and became a hit. Great job. Did Michael or Stevie uh, do a lot of takes, typically, of tracks? or Steve, Steve, Steve would do it until he got it right. Michael would just do the same thing. That's the school they came up from. They went, they're not, they do they want to cheat, they'll cheat on themselves, you know. They didn't have anything, they had to do it. They ain't got no uh auto-tune, no none, none of the stuff they had there. They got now. You know what I mean? They'll make you sound good without you not being able to sing. But uh they did get it until they got it right. If they didn't get it today, they'll try again tomorrow. Both of them. They're both of perfectionists. I know Stevie's group is called Wonder Love. Um, was it always called that? Is it still called that? What's the history uh, of Wonder Love? Uh, he, he, that, that, that was Wonder Love when he had the girls. That, that's that been going on since... Uh, it was Wonder Love when Ray was in, uh, in the group in 72. So it's been going on. That's what we've been calling him. The band. Now he don't know how to use Wonder Love no more. He's, he's my band. Oh, you don't use Wonder Love no more. But, you know, we ain't been out in a while, so hopefully he won't go out this time and use it again. <laughs> At some point, you became musical director? Yeah, I got lucky enough. He did the boys, and then you take over, and, and, and that's what I do. But he's still the boss, trust me. Trust me, he's still the boss. <laughs> and that's for sure, but he gave me the title for a while. That's it. For the last 10, 15 years, 10, I can't remember when. I got to tell you, Nate, uh, A Time to Love, I thought, was as good as Stevie Record since he had done in the 70s, you know, and um, that's the last one. It was kind of, right. And, he, and it, it wasn't promoted as much, you know what I mean? Some reason, I don't know, it was a change of times or something, but it should have been a bigger hit than it was. You know what I mean? He still sells records now. Don't think he didn't sell. He sell. You know, I don't know how many it was, but <clears throat> it was a great album. I saw Stevie uh, first time, I think, was uh, 1980 at the Forum for the uh -huh. Hours in July tour. Um, right. I don't know if you remember. That was, that was that. Dennis. That was Dennis Davis playing drums. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, we... But that was my first 
uh, experience, so in person, of just the incredible charisma and what he commands on a stage and how captivated he had that 17,000 people. Yeah. That was just amazing. That's what I'm saying. God give him, man. He's got to give him. That's, that's what I said. He's incredibly talented. I mean, but you know, like I said, he came up from that school. Okay. The Motown school was a heck of a school when they, they taught, they taught, uh, the artist etiquettes. They okay to tell them etiquettes. If not, if not, and how to carry yourself, for, uh, how to perform. They taught, they taught all that during that Mot Motown era. So he, when he came out, he came out. And you remember, he, he had a uh, the song when he was 11 years old, 12 years old. And he had a hit there. So, you know, I did been around the guys that it was around, Temptation, uh, my, everybody else. He learned a lot. He learned a lot. Um, yeah, so, Nate, um, there's a guy um, I know named uh, Martin out of the U.K. He's a uh, deep, deep record collector. And he uh -huh. had a, a few sessions he wanted uh, just to bounce off of you to just find out uh, if you did work on them and if you remember okay. these, okay, okay. One is um, Michael Wyckoff, Tell Me Love. Yeah, I did that, I played on that. I remember that. I did play on it. He was wondering if it was, if it was you or David Shields. So, I played on Michael Wyckoff's album too. I did. David, David played on it too. I think both of David's from Detroit. God bless his soul. I think you played on it too. But I remember playing on Michael Wyckoff's. I remember the name. I remember the album. And another one is uh, Stephen Sterling, One Magic Night. I don't remember that one. Steve, what was it? What was it done in England? From 1982, Stephen and Sterling was the act. Oh, I can't remember that one. What about Kamiko Kasai? I did. I did Kamiko. I remember that. It's a Japanese girl. Yes. I did play on that. I just talked to Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. I think that was one of his artists. Trevor is the one that got, got me to play with his party system. So he used to play with Steve Bates, He's a saxophone player in jazz. He used to play with Steve back in 72, 73, 72. And he, I played on that album. I know I played with Kamiko, yes. Sylvia Striplin? Probably sort of sound familiar. Says it's a Roy Roy Ayers production. Oh, I might have. If Roy Roy produced it. I know Roy. I knew Roy. Maybe he called me. I can't remember that one. Uh, I, I, I knew Roy. I just got that. I, 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 uh, Dennis. I met Roy through Dennis. Dennis used to play with him. So Dennis Davis, God bless him. But I, that one is still a question. You got to put that on and let me hear it. Then I know if it's me. That Stephen and Sterling one, um, it shows here. Uh, Bobby Nunn did a track called "Don't Stop." Uh, oh, I played with Bobby Nunn. I played on his album. Yeah. And uh, to tomorrow says it's uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire kind of groove, tricky bass line. Boom. Yeah, well, I probably did. I probably did. I might have played on there. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember that fifty years ago. A long time ago. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Final two questions, Nate. Uh, um, one is, uh, what what project are you the most proud of from your whole career? Oh, uh, uh, Stevie, uh, Song Skill Live, and, uh, and the Jackson tri uh, uh, Trial, Jackson. It's two, two of the favorite, my favorite albums because I learned so much during that time. I was still young, and I learned so much in, uh, about production, uh, how songs were written. Uh, matter of fact, I came up with Free during the time when, when Denise was it, with us, and that was in the seventies. In the seventies, seventy four, I came up. I came. I came up with that by being around them, and I started playing the bass line that I, cre I created. She came over, started singing, and that's that, that's how I, I was, it was done. So creativity means a lot. That's for sure. And those are two creative cats, uh, Michael and Steve. I learned a lot from both of them. And Michael was so young, I couldn't believe that this guy was telling me that, uh, that, that, that anybody could sing a guitar part. And, and, and listen, listen to the Howard Hotel or this place hotel, they had to change the name. But uh, the solo was ridiculous. The solo was ridiculous. It's totally. Yeah. Paul Jackson's been on the show too. Great guy. Oh, he's good. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, did you ever get to meet Prince? Yeah. Just, that, that, that's amazing you said that. Uh, I was in, um, I met him about three, three or four times. He came on the show and then sat in. But the most amazing thing that was happening was in Paris. I, I can't remember how many years ago. And he came and he was playing in Paris. I think Sheila was there too. And uh, we was, was on the road and we were moving. The first time I met him, I said, Steve, I said, Steve, let's go see Prince. He was 17 years old. Okay? We went and saw him in Long Beach. I'll never forget that. And I said, because I, I actually had a tape somebody had gave me in 1975 of him that they said he wants to be like Stevie and she let Stevie hear that. Uh, but, but during the time, I was scared to give it to him. But anyway, in the Paris, I think it was in the 90s, um, or maybe in 2000, um, he uh, was in his room talking to Steven after, after the show. He played on the show. And I said, hey, man, how you doing? You doing good? And he came up and gave me a hug. He didn't hug nobody. Okay? That that just moved <laughs> That that just moved me, man. That moved me. Yeah. Okay. That moved me. He gave me a hug. And now he's gone. Okay. I'm back. All right, man. I'm getting emotional. I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I was lucky enough to uh, be there once when Stevie and Prince were on stage together at the Glam Slam Club downtown LA. It was phenomenal. Yeah, it was. I was there, but I didn't play. Oh man. Oh. oh man. Go well, ahead. Hey man. Um so much appreciate your time, Nate. And uh why don't you go ahead and plug your record again and whatever else you have going on? Music most multiplex and bass day. I send y'all I send a copy of the picture so you can put it in a, on the what's the name? Uh, music multiplex is the album I'm doing and it should be on in September. <laughs> <laughs> That's and it. We're, and we're hoping for new Stevie music too. And, yeah. Uh, He's supposed to release next month, this end of this month or next month. What's okay. The best, what's the best place people can keep up with what you have going on? Do you got a website for them? The real, the, 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 yeah, the real the, the real Nathan Watts.com. Beautiful. The real Nathan Watts.com. And I'm on Instagram. The real Nathan Watts is on Instagram too. All right. We've had the real Nathan Watts here. We've been very lucky. Thank you so much. And uh Man, thank you for all the great bass lines and music from all these years. Thank you, my brother. Thank you very much. I'm very, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Be well, man. Take care. All right. Much love. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder... You can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, Shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the Media Services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.